In this presentation, I want to talk about the origins of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, as I'll often refer to it, which is one of the most important conventions for this field of law, and possibly for public international law generally. So I'm going to be moving through a variety of topics. Why is UNCLOS important? What does it cover? Why would states negotiate a law on this subject matter? how that law has developed over the 20th century, and particularly through treaties, the origins of what's called the Third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea that ran from 1973 to 1982, the course of those negotiations, and where we are now. So let's begin with a basic question. Why is the Convention on the Law of the Sea important? Well, it's been referred to as a constitution for the oceans, and that's because it is simply a huge and incredibly detailed treaty. It runs to 320 articles, nine annexes, the implementing agreements on topics such as fishing and seabed mining. And in 2013, 165 of 193 UN member states were parties. So it has enormous coverage. Another very important fact is that the United States, while it is not a party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, accepts most of it as binding customary international law, and on many topics is bound by equivalent treaty provisions in any event. So what does the Convention on the Law of the Sea cover? Well, it includes rules for coastal states on their rights in the territorial sea and innocent passage, something we'll cover in a later screencast, rules governing foreign commercial shipping and their interactions with coastal states, the existence of a contiguous zone in which states can enforce their customs laws, an exclusive economic zone governing, surprisingly, or rather unsurprisingly, economic activities out to 200 nautical miles from shore, and rights in a continental shelf under the water column. It also includes special rules on the status of archipelagos and how waters around them are to be governed, certain guarantees of navigation through international straits, and rights of access to the sea for landlocked states. More than that, it also includes rules on uses of the high seas by all states, including fishing and duties regarding conservation, as well as navigation, rules on marine pollution from both shipping and land, rules governing marine scientific research, and given its incredible scope and detail, unsurprisingly, it includes rules on how to resolve disputes regarding the interpretation or application of any of these rules. However, during the negotiation of UNCLOS, a major controversy was how to govern seabed mining in the area beyond national jurisdiction. So once we get beyond the exclusive economic zone in the continental shelf, what rules will govern mining in that deep seabed region, or as it's referred to in the convention, the area with a capital A? This may lead you to ask, well, why would states agree to have a law of the sea? Wouldn't they simply be better to be free to do whatever they want to do on the high seas or beyond national jurisdiction? And this is where scholarship helps us understand some of the reasons states have for cooperating in this fashion. So I'm going to introduce very quickly two theories, one of the balancing of interest between states and the other of reciprocity. So McDougall and Burke in their major work on the public order of the oceans saw the law of the sea as balancing two sets of interests what they called exclusive interests and inclusive or general interests. So exclusive interests belong to, for example, coastal or flag states. So coastal states will want control of fisheries close to their shore, and flag states will want exclusive control of their flag vessels on the high seas. But those have to be weighed against inclusive or general interests of all states. All states will want freedom of navigation in territorial waters, or may uh, want to cooperate regarding high seas fishing so it doesn't become a tragedy of the commons. So the key is balancing these different interests. And the classic example is, as I've already indicated, rules on the use of the territorial sea. So how do you balance the rights of a coastal state to regulate its fisheries with other states' interests in being able to navigate through those waters? However, a note of caution that we can strike about this balancing theory comes from the work of Guidel, a major French writer on the law of the sea in the early 20th century. And he suggested that this kind of balancing approach could imply a false opposition, because coastal states will also often be flag states. 
So the same state will want both control over its waters and freedom of navigation in other states' waters. That brings reciprocity into play. That means you're only going to propose rules you are prepared to be bound by, because the rules you seek to enforce on others, say as a coastal state, may come back to bite you when you are a navigating state and want freedom of navigation through other coastal states' waters. So the law of the sea in the 20th century has developed principally through a process of codification and progressive development. So codification means we put rules that everyone already agrees to in writing and progressive development is essentially the suggestion or negotiation of new rules. Both the League of Nations and the United Nations system have provided a forum for both this codification and progressive development of rules on the law of the sea, largely through treaty making. So sometimes treaties reduce to writing rules everyone already agrees upon, and sometimes they create new rules. So let's look at the history of the law of the sea through treaties. These are the major 20th century treaty making efforts. There was the League of Nations Hague Codification Conference of 1930, the first UN conference on the law of the sea in 1958, a second UN conference in 1960, and then the incredibly long running third UN conference on the law of the sea from 1973 to 1982. And some older textbooks in particular will use the abbreviation UNCLOS only to refer to that third UN conference. So briefly, when the League of Nations contemplated in 1930 the law of the sea, what was it concerned with? Essentially, they were concerned with questions about the territorial sea. And these questions were debated, but they did not result in a treaty being adopted. To boil the debate down, most states supported the idea that states had sovereignty over their territorial sea, that this was a zone of sovereign jurisdiction. However, on the critical question of how wide the territorial sea should be, there was no consensus. There was traditionally a cannon shot rule, the idea that states had a zone of control in their territorial waters out to the distance that a cannon could be fired, so a sort of theory of military force. But there was consensus that rule was no longer really useful and should be replaced by something more precise, a rule expressed in nautical miles. But there was no agreement on whether it should be a three, four or six nautical mile territorial sea. And the division here was between the great naval powers, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, who wanted the maximum freedom of movement for their warships, and coastal states, who wanted the maximum zone of control near their coasts. So we've had that debate at the League of Nations, little progress has been made. We turn now to the United Nations era after 1945. What's happening here? Well, let's look into the history of the first UN conference on the law of the sea in 1958. Now, following World War II, there was increasing state interest in control over maritime natural resources. President Truman of the United States issued proclamations on US control of its continental shelf and fisheries adjacent the coast. That development of the law of the sea by states suddenly makes codification of the law of the sea an important issue. The United Nations International Law Commission the ILC, a committee of experts that reports to the General Assembly on legal issues, begins a project in which they aim to produce draft articles on the law of the sea, draft articles which could eventually be turned into a treaty. So this is both potentially a codification and progressive development exercise. So the ILC works on the issue for a number of years, from 1949 to 1956, and eventually produces its articles concerning the law of the sea and submits them to the UN General Assembly. Now, these articles then formed the basis for negotiations in Geneva in 1958, the first UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, sometimes referred to as UNCLOS I. In the course of debating the ILC articles, they're split up into a variety of treaties on different topics, and the precise formulation of the rules in these treaties changes sometimes in the course of negotiations, but often quite a lot of detail survives from the ILC drafting. So we have treaties produced on the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, on the high seas, on fishing and conservation of the living resources of the high seas, and on the continental shelf, as well as an optional protocol on compulsory dispute settlement. But one key issue goes unresolved, and that's the width of the territorial 
C. There is agreement, however, that the contiguous zone, which is adjacent to the territorial sea, cannot exceed 12 nautical miles. So there's at least some sense that there's an outer limit to coastal state control at about 12 nautical miles, but no, ex no rule is settled on the breadth of the territorial sea. So the second UN conference on the law of the sea of 1960 is called to resolve this one single issue, the deadlock on the width of the territorial sea, and a proposal for a six-mile territorial sea plus a six-mile contiguous zone fails by one vote. So this sets the stage for the third UN conference, the really long-running one, and by this time in the 1970s, there are a range of new developments that suggest the need for a new convention. So there's an issue surrounding seabed resources, increasing issues surrounding fisheries, protection of the marine environment, and decolonisation. And I'll come to each of those in turn. The first point about seabed resources is that large parts of the deep seabed beyond national jurisdiction are covered with polymetallic nodules that are rich in valuable materials like nickel, cobalt, and so on. And they look something like this. They're exactly how they're described. They're small nodules composed of various metals found on the deep seafloor. At around this time, new estimates of the quantity of these nodules on the deep seabed, along with the development of new technology, suggested that there would soon be a gold rush of deep sea mining, that this could be extremely profitable. The question then arises, well, if there is going to be this gold rush, should all this wealth go to developed states that already have the technology necessary to do this? Won't this just result in newly independent states losing out once again on the rich getting rich and the poor getting poorer? So how will we handle this as an international community? Also, there's a question about fisheries jurisdiction. So an increasing number of states are asserting that they have a 200 nautical mile exclusive fishery zone off their coast. And what will be done about that development? And also... Pollution had not been a big issue in previous conventions, but now protection of the marine environment was much more on the agenda, particularly because of the major oil spill of 1967, the Torrey Canyon disaster, which brought the issue to particular prominence. Also, as I've already hinted, we had the issue of newly independent states emerging in a post-colonial era. So the shape of the international community was now very different from the post-World War II international community in which the United Nations had been formed. So you have a large number of newly independent states, effectively a majority in the General Assembly at the UN, and they are much poorer states and much less developed than the states that had founded the UN system. Now, Malta's ambassador to the United Nations, a diplomat called Arvid Padro, says, well, wait a minute, Many of these issues are closely related, or we're not going to reach agreement on one without reaching agreement on the other. Therefore, we need to address all of these issues in a package so we can negotiate trade-offs between them. So we're going to need a new Law of the Sea Convention. And that's how we get to the third UN conference. However, we are then faced with long and difficult negotiations. As I've repeatedly emphasised, this is a very long treaty negotiation process possibly the longest in history. It runs from 1973 to 1982. Negotiation proceeds by consensus. You don't vote on individual articles. And that's because the whole thing is being negotiated as a package deal. Everything is being traded off against everything else. And the subject matter involved is huge. All ocean activities are in the mix. The simple scale of what was going on means that much of the work has to proceed in committees, and many of these committees consist really of the groups most interested in particular issues, for example, fisheries or the continental shelf. And the other point to make here is that the whole idea of the package deal was that this was going to be a convention which did not allow states to enter reservations. So reservations normally mean you can say we accept all of the treaty, but not the following provisions. This was going to be a treaty where you accepted all of it or none of it. There was to be no picking and choosing, and that allowed some of the trade-offs involved to be negotiated. When you couple the package deal with consensus decision-making, this means that the entire convention is a finely balanced set of trade-offs between different interest groups. As we've already said, the result is a vast and seemingly comprehensive convention referred to by Ambassador Tomiko as a constitution for the oceans. 
However, at the last minute, the adoption of the final text was not by consensus. The United States forces a vote. Why does it do that? Well, the answer is that the United States and a number of other industrial states have concerns about the deep seabed mining regime that's been established as part of this complex set of trade-offs in the UNCLOS negotiations. And here's a stylized view of what was going on. So everyone agreed that mining on the seafloor beyond national jurisdiction would require the supervision of an international seabed authority, an ISA. But over here on the left of my diagram, developing states wanted a strong ISA, internationally controlled mining and production controls, so limits on the amount of minerals that could be extracted from the deep sea floor so as not to disturb their mining industries and technology transfer requirements so they too could have access to mining technology. Highly industrialized states that already had corporations investing in deep seabed mining wanted a much weaker ISA, essentially just a registry system. And they wanted a commercialized system of mining, not one that was run by the international community. And they wanted protection for uh, the investments that had already been made by private companies and protection of the intellectual property in the technology they had developed. So the complex compromise ISA system that was eventually established under the convention proved unacceptable to developed states. However, without them participating, no seabed mining would ever occur because they were the only ones with the technology. So they had an effective veto. And indeed, this issue could have blocked them participating in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea at all. So this was a very serious deadlock. So the result was the so-called Implementation Agreement of 1994. It simplified the ISA arrangements. Developed states were going to have greater influence over ISA decision-making procedures, and mining corporations were going to pay much lower royalties on their activities outside national jurisdiction. This had the strange result, though, that in effect the deep seabed mining regime was amended before the treaty even came into force, which is highly unusual. Normally you can only amend a treaty once it's come into force. But this implementation agreement allowed developed states to join UNCLOS with confidence that they had an international seabed authority regime they could live with. So that was the course of negotiations. Where are we now? Well, UNCLOS is now the most important treaty governing the uses of the oceans. However, despite the ISA amendments or the implementation agreement being designed to meet US objections, it is still not ratified. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the seabed mining regime remains uh, a central political issue in that decision. Nonetheless, as I've already said, the US accepts much of UNCLOS's binding customary international law and here is the further reading I recommend on this topic in some of the uh, key classic and most recent textbooks. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting.